Hi everyone, I'm Deveshwar, and today I'll be talking about Secure Floaty Point Training. This is a joint work with my colleagues at Microsoft Research, Anvesh Devyan Rahul, and my advisor at Berkeley, Don Song. So I'll begin this presentation by explaining why secure training is needed, and I'll do that with the help of an example. So consider there are two healthcare providers, each with access to some sensitive patient data, and these providers want to put their resources together and train a machine learning model for disease prediction. Unfortunately, they can't do that because regulations just won't allow them to share their data with someone else. So this is where secure training comes into the picture, and it enables these parties to achieve their goal through the use of secure two-party computation techniques. And what it ensures is that only the trained model is revealed at the end of this protocol, and nothing else about the uh, secret data is leaked. If needed, secure training can also go a step further and even ensure that the secret model is kept private. So in this case, only the inference results are revealed. So this is one example of secure training, and similarly, you could think of other examples such as fraud detection and urban sensing. So we just discussed why secure tra training is needed. Now let's see how you actually implement it in practice. So the providers in our previous example will hire some ML practitioner, and this practitioner will give us some PyTorch code. So given this PyTorch code, we know that it will eventually reduce to some floating point operations like comparison, addition, et cetera. And for all of these operations, we already have the corresponding two PC protocols from prior work. And in this space, uh, SecFloat is a state of the art. So given this floating point two PC building blocks, we can put them together and get a secure version of our, secure, uh, of our training uh, script. So the reason why we uh, why, uh, implementing secure training in this manner is, is beneficial is that uh, we get a solution which is as precise as PyTorch. So whatever the, uh, the ML practitioner intended is going to happen in the secure domain. However, as you can see, there's a, a problem in that because of uh, the scale of training, we end up with a prohibitive cost and that limits adoption. So the goal that we set out to achieve in this work is how can we reduce the cost of secure training without sacrificing this precision guarantee? The reason I'm stressing so much on the precision guarantee is that there's also an alternate approach uh, in this space which uh, improves the cost by uh, introducing approximations and sacrificing this guarantee. I'll, uh, I'll get to that approach at the end of this talk. But for now, we need both properties. We need precision guarantee as well as an improved cost. Okay. So matrix multiplications, as we know, are the training bottleneck. That's why we have GPUs in the first place. And this transfers over to the secure setting as well. In particular, when we implement secure training with SecFloat, which is a semi-honest 2PC library, we see that 99% of the cost goes towards matrix multiplications. Now, the way matrix multiplications are implemented in SecFloat as well as prior work is that they are decomposed into uh, primitive operations like floating point addition and multiplication. And since these operations are expensive, we also end up with an expensive matrix multiplication. So in this work, we, we don't try to optimize these primitive operations. Instead, we focus on building specialized protocol for compound operations. The idea is that uh, working on compound operations should allow more room for optimization. So this is what we do. Uh, the matrix multiplication beacon, instead of reducing to FPR and FPML, reduces to summations and outer products. And we give uh, specialized protocols for, summation, or for both of these compound operations. So uh, as a concrete example, for a matrix multiplication of uh, 100 cross 100 matrices, we get a 5.5 times improvement by taking this approach uh, with, with summation as opposed to just uh, doing summation naively with floating point addition. And similarly, we get a 3.5 times improvement for outer products. In the rest of this talk, I'll be focusing on the improvements we made to summation because uh, floating point addition was the, the real bottleneck uh, in, in prior work. Okay, so uh, let's get into those details. Okay, so first of all, what is floating point? Let's start with that. You can think of a floating point number as a tuple of two, in the, uh, two integers, one in the base and one in the exponent. Another important thing to note uh, about these numbers is that a real value can be represented by multiple floating point numbers, but only one such uh, number actually corresponds to the, uh, the normalized form. The reason this normalized form is important is because all the floating point operations assume that their input will be in this form. Okay, so with that out of the way, we can see how floating point addition works. So we start with two inputs, uh, both of them in the normalized form. The first step in addition is an alignment process. Uh, basically, what this operation does is uh, it makes sure that the exponents of both inputs are the same. Once we have uh, the inputs aligned, we can add them, and we get some intermediate addition result. Now, there are two problems with this uh, addition result. 
The first is that it is not in the normalized form, and we need to fix that because subsequent operations are expecting a normalized form. And the second problem is that we have more bits than, how, than what we started with. We actually have almost double the number of bits. And we need to fix that because if we don't, then we'll end up with a bit with blow up. Every time you do an addition, you get more bits in your uh, output. So to fix that, uh, floating point addition also has two more operation, a normalization step and a rounding step, and that sums up the entire floating point addition protocol. So overall, uh, in, this, in this entire algorithm, the, the cost, the, the real cost of the uh, algorithm, is, uh, it lies in the, in the final two steps, the normalization and rounding steps. It actually accounts for 82% of the cost. But clearly, we can't simply get, up, get rid of these operations because, yeah, they serve uh, an important function. Okay, so given these uh, floating point additions, the way summation works is that uh, we, we, uh, we do pairwise summations over the inputs and we evaluate them in a tree-like format. And what happens with this is that we end up with n minus one normalization and rounding steps. And since these operations are expensive, the solution uh, uh, becomes quite expensive. So the first step, uh, the, the first natural idea we pursue is how about we, uh, so we can't get rid of these operations completely, how about we just perform them once? Okay, so something like this. While it, it seems like this actually uh, is, is a good idea, it turns out that it actually ends up being a lot worse than the prior solution. The reason for that is without these operations, the, the bit width uh, sort of grow uh, unrestricted. And we end up with uh, a bit width right before the, the normalization and rounding step that is linear uh, in the number of values being added. So concretely, uh, for FP32, it will be 36N, which is massive and completely impractical. Okay, so that was the first idea. The second idea we think of is uh, how about, so it, it seems in the prior solution, uh, the bit width is growing so much because we are doing these pairwise alignment steps. How about we uh, align everything at once? So we pick one exponent and align all the inputs to that exponent. Uh, well, this solution is, is a lot better than the previous one in that uh, the bit width only grows logarithmically with n now, but the, the concrete bit width that we have to work with is still quite large. So there's a constant term there which, makes, which also makes this uh, approach, uh, sorry, which, which makes this baseline also uh, impractical. So, so, so far we have already gotten rid of all pairwise operations uh, in summation. Where will the next improvement come from? So we get further improvement by introducing errors into the computation. Now you might be thinking that so far I've been uh, stressing on how important precision is and now I'm talking about introducing error. Well, this is actually quite common in floating point operations. And in fact, the baseline solution here is actually, it actually has a lot of error already. And when we set out to uh, um, to improve cost, we did, not start, we did not intend to make a summation protocol which is the most precise one. We wanted one which is at least as precise as PyTorch. So we can uh, incur some more error. And we incur this error uh, through this thresholding function. And what this function does is, it simply ignores values which are less than a threshold. And in the paper we show how you can carefully set this threshold such that you can work with smaller bits. And you also get this provable guarantee that uh, whatever computation is happening will be at least as precise as PyTorch. So with the combination of these three simple ideas, we get a summation protocol which offers a three-fold improvement over SecFloat. In terms of performance, we, get an eight, uh, we, get, we are eight, eight times faster. In terms of rounds, we are also five times faster because normalization and rounding were uh, uh, round intensive. And we also get a, uh, an asymptotic improvement in terms of worst case error. Um, yeah, you can look at the paper for, for the details on, on how we do that. Okay, so we, saw, uh, uh, like, so we saw that our specialized protocol for, for summation has nice improvements. Now let's see how that translates to, uh, to the performance over end-to-end -end training. So we took some prior benchmarks and we evaluated both SecFloat and Beacon, our work, uh, uh, using the FP32 representation. And we found that we improved the cost of SecFloat by up to five times. Okay. So like I said, these are our improvements uh, for FP32, but there's actually another uh, avenue for improvement. So we already know from ML community that there are other floating point formats which are, much, which are more efficient and work just as well. So in this work, we also look at those formats and in particular, the most popular one is B416. Uh, since I'm running out of time, I, I, I won't get into the details, but the high level idea is that uh, yeah, fix, uh, B, B416 training uses a, a, a mixed precision, so it uses both B416 and FP32, and this is incompatible with prior works. 
Um, but in, in Beacon, we introduced the support for MPR representations, which allow us to leverage uh, this, uh, this, uh, this format and uh, get some nice improvements. So overall, with the support for Bflow 16 training, we get up to seven times improvement over prior work. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about how we improve the cost of secure training without sacrificing the precision guarantee. But as I alluded to earlier, there's also an alternate approach called secure fixed point training, which sacrifices precision guarantee to improve performance. In particular, they introduce 64-bit uh, fixed point approximations uh, instead of uh, the, the floating point operations. And as you can see, there's a long line of work here with KS22 being the state of the art. So uh, in this work, uh, even though the, the guarantees provided by our work and, uh, and this line of work is different, we uh, did an evaluation to see how much exactly are we uh, paying for this precision guarantee that we are offering. And we find that um, the, this overhead on, on the same benchmarks is only three to six times, which I think is reasonable. The reason I say that is, as a, as a developer, you have two options. First is, you could work with secure fixed point training, get a better performance, but then you have to deal with this uh, uncertainty of potential accuracy loss. Or you could work uh, with Beacon, and you would take this hit, uh, three to six times hit, but then you have this guarantee that you, you essentially have a, a secure PyTorch at your disposal, which I think is, is nice and would make sense in a lot of scenarios. In conclusion, Beacon is a secure floating point training library, which is provably as precise as PyTorch, and is also up to seven times faster than uh, SecFloat. It achieves this speed up through uh, specialized support for MADMLs, as well as mixed precision training. Our paper and code are public, and thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>